Hey nerds, welcome back to the show. In this episode, we're going to talk all about Dungeons and Dragons, the D&D in Nordic D&D. Stay tuned. Guys, welcome to the Nerd Hangout. If this is your first visit to the Nordic D&D Nerd Hangout, be sure to subscribe, click that bell so you don't miss anything. Dungeons and Dragons was created in 1974 by Gary Gygax and Dave Anderson, and it's the most famous fantasy role-playing game ever made. I think it's fair to say that Dungeons & Dragons has inspired tons and tons of other games, books and even films. Dungeons & Dragons is an adventure story game generally played with a group of friends, where one takes on the role as a DM, the Dungeon Master, or a GM, the Game Master. The unique aspect of D&D is that there is no present win condition, unless you play a bot module, meaning a game pre-made for the DM to follow, but I will get into that later. D&D is a collaborate storytelling game where the win condition is what the DM chooses it to be and can vary from saving a damsel in distress to clearing a cave of goblins to saving an entire world from a demonic invasion. The length of the game varies as well. You can also play one single game called a one shot where after you have saved a damsel in distress the game is over. Or a longer game that takes many sessions where after you save the damsel in distress you find out that a band of goblins have stolen her children and fled to a nearby cave. So to find out that cave and to clear it out to save her children will take many sessions and game nights before you're able to finish. You can also play a D&D &D game that will take you years to play. It can be like this, after saving the damsel in distress and saving her children for the goblins, and you are about to kill the last one of them, you come to a special room where a very special goblin is performing a ceremony. He seems to be a sorcerer of some kind. He has summoned a portal. It leads to the demonic world, and just as you are to strike him down, you come too late. It is finished. He has cast the ritual, and a giant portal opens up, and the cave explodes open to the surface, and thousands and thousands of demons flood out into your peaceful world. Now only you can save it from invasion. And you have a game that will take you years to finish. Sounds cool, huh? It is. So the question is now, how do you play Dungeons & Dragons? Well, first of all, to play, you need a group of friends to gather. And you'll need a set of dice, a pen, a paper, and the player handbook that contains the basic rules of the game. Now, each player creates a single character. First, you choose a race you like to play. You can be a human, an elf, a dwarf, a halfling, a gnome, and many other you can choose from in the player handbook where you find the basic races. Each race has its unique attributes or features. Then after that, you will choose a class for your character, like a fighter, a bard, a ranger, a monk, a rogue, barbarian, druid, wizard, warlock, or a sorcerer, all depending what you want to play. Now, what you choose will define what you are able to do and what you are really good at. If you want to be the best stealthy fighter who lurks in the shadows, then the rogue will be your best choice for that. Now, you can be other classes and be good at stealth, but some classes are better suited for specific abilities, especially if you want to be the master at it. An eldritch knight fighter will never wield as much power as a sorcerer or a wizard. Now you can of course mix the classes if you want, like for example a bard who becomes a warlock for selling his soul to become the greatest bard in history of the world, and then becomes what is called a bardlock, a character with both the bard class and the warlock class. This is called multiclassing. Then you have to choose a background. Now backgrounds is defined like this in the player handbook, that every story has a beginning. Your character's background reveals where you come from, how you became an adventurer, and your place in the world. Your fighter might have been a courageous knight or a grizzled soldier. 
Your wizard could have been a sage or an artisan. Your rogue might have gotten by as a guild thief or commanded an audience as a jester. Choosing a background provides you with important story cues about your character's identity. The most important question to ask about your background is what changed. Why did you stop doing whatever your background described and started adventuring? The sample backgrounds in this chapter provides both concrete benefits, features, proficiencies, and languages and role-playing suggestions. So when you choose a background, you will get different, uh, like I said, their features, proficiencies, and even languages. And you can choose from um, different types of, of backgrounds, like an artisan, a uh, noble, a uh, far traveler, and all of them have different abilities and proficiencies that they give you when you choose them. So choose one which, pass, uh, which matches your class. Anyway, after you have created a character, you have chosen a race and a class, it is time to name your hero and write a backstory to give him or her a personality and some depth. It will help you a lot as you roleplay the character if you have written down a story about him or her, how they look, how they act and why, where they come from, does he have loved ones? Has there happened a tragic event in his life, or something happened that defines some part of how he thinks or looks or is? It can be a very simple backstory or a complex, all up to you the player and how you want to create your character. Maybe I can give an example. This is a backstory that I have written down of a character that I am currently playing in my brother Charles Johansson's campaign called Dante Resilian. He's a human war cleric. His backstory sounds like this. A once great knight of the king's army found himself in what can only be called the most evil of knights. In the comfort of his own home, a band of evil men came into the cover of darkness blocking all exits of the house and setting it on fire. Whom they were and what their motives were is not known. The only thing known is that they made sure no one was to get out of that house alive. And they were almost right. For in a desperate move of survival, a man came crushing through a weak spot in the wall and he was covered in flames and by the luck of the gods, he ran right into the water. As the men came to check if he was dead, they heard the town guards come to check out the house on fire, so they ran away. The guards found the body of a small family in the house, a woman and her two children dead, and a badly burned body of a man in the river. He was found to have a pulse, so he was rushed down to the town medical care. Dante survived, but lost all he had and was disfigured from his burns, making him cover his face behind clothing. He felt he did not have anything to live for anymore, so he joined the monastery, devoting his life to the gods and service of the king. One day, some of his fellow clerics came to him with a box. It seemed to be the only thing that survived the fire of his house. Inside the box, Dante found his armor he used from his time as a knight of the king. And he found a roll of fabric his late wife used to make clothing out of. It was velvet red. Still smelled like her. There had always been much mystery about Dante. The cleric who always covered his face to hide his scars. Not many knew how he actually looked. Dante took the fabric of his wife and suited into his godly robe. Now, he was the only mock walking around with his white godly robe and the velvet red clothing suited into it. He was known as the Velvet Red Cleric. Dante found much peace of mind in his new religious ways and the meaning of life once more in serving the gods. And as his time of mourning passed, he once more found himself getting strong again and missing his service as a fighter for the kingdom. 
So that they made a decision, knowing that his past skills as a knight would come in great advantage as a cleric soldier. So he took the path of a war cleric, dedicating his devotion to Ketos, the god of war, allowing him to once more do what he does best: fight in honor of Ketos and the king. So he found his old armor, shined it up, and put it underneath his godly robe. He took his red fabric, leftovers from his wife, suited in different parts of his armor, and in the shaft of his axe and sword, hanging by the hilt. And deep inside, Dante never forgot what had happened to his family. And one day, he will have his retribution. I will serve my God. I will serve the king, and I will find who killed my family, and I will slaughter them all. So yeah, this was this was my example of making a backstory for my character Dante Rosilion. He's actually one of my favorite characters to play. Um, so something like that. Out of that, I already knew how to act like Dante. I felt his emotion, his loss, his depression, and it was fun to like role play like this character searching vengeance for his lost family but still trying to find meaning and purpose in staying alive um it was fun anyway back to you guys and your games so now you have created your character and your backstory and you choose a background and all is ready so you gather your friends and all you need now is a DM. Now the DM or dungeon master has a bit more to do in the D&D game, both in and out of the game, because he is the one who writes the story you as the players are about to venture on. If you want to play the DM, you should consider getting the dungeon master guide, which is a great tool that tells you how to DM and gives you all kinds of tricks to make it easier for you. And if you're stuck, you can always look in that book and get moving on. Now if you compare the players to the dungeon master, think of it like uh, you the players control one character, like an actor, and the DM player is like the author and the director and the referee of the game. And one thing to know is that it is not like the DM is against the players where he's trying to kill you and win. Not to be mistaken with the monsters, the DM is controlling, they most definitely are trying to kill you. But no, it's more like you and the DM creating a story together. Now, the DM controls everything in the world uh, you are adventuring in, uh, even the, the NPCs, which means the non-playable characters, which are all the people that you're going to meet or interact with, is controlled by the DM. He also, of course, controls all the obstacles you're going to face, um, the riddles, the traps, the encounters, uh, all the enemies. He controls everything. He lays down the path that you are about to walk on. Now, there are different ways the DM can dungeon master a game. He can use a pre-written module, which he can buy, like Curse of Strat or Dragon of Icebire Peak, where he buys this book and everything is already written in the book that he needs. All the storytelling, the encounters, the adventure, the NPCs, the monsters, the magic items, everything, the story hook, the plot hook, everything is already written down and planned out for him, so he just has to study it and read it. Or he can make everything himself from scratch, which is called a homebrew world, like I am doing in our podcast, Nordic D&D, the Ariana Saga. There will be a link to the podcast if you want to check it out, how our uh, D&D game is and how it sounds and how I have done it from scratch. Now I want to tell you that I will put up a lot of links down below to awesome channels that you can get more in-depth with how to play specific classes best, how to beat a great DM and other resources for new dungeon uh, masters and new D&D players like you. There's so many ways and good resources out there to get inspired from. 
One of the smartest ways also to learn a, to play the game, apart from reading the player handbook, is listening to a podcast like ours and all the others out there, or looking at streams like Critical Role. It just gave me so much more, because of course reading the player handbook is one thing, but seeing it in action really is learn it. It really helps me put uh, things in perspective when you see the things written in the player handbook played out. And one thing we haven't covered yet is talking about dice. You cannot play Dungeons and Dragons or talk about Dungeons and Dragons without talking about dices. Everyone who plays Dungeons and Dragons becomes a massive collector of dice. Trust me. Now you have these kind of dice here. You have your D20, which is the one that you're gonna use most in your games. Then you have your D12, you have your D10, you have your D8, and you have your D6, and you have your D4. And yeah, and the dice that you use the most is your D20. So, how does this come in action when you play? Well, when your character states an action, something that he wants to do, through role playing, the DM will ask you to roll a check with your 20 sided die, where he has to set a mark that you must hit higher than to succeed. John, can you maybe show them an example? It goes like this The dungeon master asks you a situation like something you come to a bridge and there's a guard standing by the bridge. You, the players, have to go over the bridge, but it seems to be guarded. What do you do? Now me as a player can say, you know what? I wanna go talk to the guard and probably try to persuade him to let us go by. Then the dungeon master will say, okay, you come to the guard, he asks what you're doing. You say, please guard, we are heading over the bridge to the town where there's help needed and we are to provide that help. Then the dungeon master will say to you, you know what? Roll a persuasions check. And then you take your die, 20 sided die, you roll that die and I rolled a 19. Now, the, the die is always from one to 20 when you roll checks, and if you roll high enough, then you get to persuade the guard from letting you pass. Now, the other out outcome would be that I rolled too low, because the dungeon master can say, you know what, if you have to persuade this guard, you have to roll a 15 or higher, because he's very strict. And I rolled only a 12, and he was saying, you know what, no you are not getting by. Then the players will have to decide among themselves, okay, how do we then cross the bridge to get to the town that we need to go? Now they can choose to go around the bridge, over the water, find a boat, or again, just decide, you know what, we're going to fight this guard because we need to go over the town. And everything is a possibility. Now the outcome can be that this guard is really strong and they start and try to fight the guard and he actually kills them all. This is very unlikely, but it can happen. So you have to be careful on what you choose, especially if you're a low level player. The players level up as you go and become stronger and stronger and stronger. At one point, you can just intimidate the guard and say, if you don't let us go by, we're gonna kill you instantly. There are four of us and you are alone. Then the dungeon master will say to you, you know what? He's timid, roll an intimidation check and then you roll another die. And the dungeon master will set a DC for that as well, like a 12. You have to roll higher than a 12 to intimidate him, and you roll and you roll a 13, and he runs off scared, or he bows down and says, okay, go, 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 just spare my life. Again, if you fail, you probably have to fight him. And it's all kinds of different aspects in the game like this that you have to make checks to see if you can pass or you can go away or you can fight or whatever you do. And this is just so fun because the outcome always depends on the player's choices and the roll of a die. One thing to state also which is important is that you add a modifier to all your checks depending on your player's skills. That means if he is very good at stealth, you'll have a modifier to your stealth. So when the DM asks you to make a stealth check, you roll a 14, you probably have a plus three or something like that <clears throat> as a modifier that you add to your rolls. We will get into the mechanics of uh, the games and how you use all the abilities in another episode, guys. But that was great, John, thank you. Yeah. So that is called skill checks. 
There's also something called uh, saving throws. For example, if you uh, snap a trap, you have to make something called a dexterity saving throw, and you roll again your d20 and you add your dexterity modifier, and that means that it will check how dexterous you are to evade or avoid being hit by the trap. And then you, the DM also will set a mark there to see if you make it or not. Now, if, when you roll your, your dexterity saving roll, it is to see if you are able to jump out of the way and take no damage or half damage, or if you fail, full damage. And then we go to the attack. The d20 is also used for rolling an attack. And when you hit with your attack, uh, you have to match the AC, the armor class of the target you're hitting. And when you hit it, you get to use your weapons. Now here is where you come with the other dice. The d12, the d10, the d8, the d6, the d4. These are all kinds of weapons. And the dice differ from which kind or which kind of spell you use for your attacks. And that is a lot of fun when you get to choose a lot of different dice and throw them together and make a shit lot of damage. That is satisfying, guys. So yeah, there's a lot of different ways that you can learn to play Dungeons and & Dragons. And if you want to get nice tips, there are a lot of uh, YouTube videos uh, where you can get a lot of great uh, inspiration and tips from. And I would recommend Matthew Mercer again. Um, he has given me so many great advice as a dungeon master and a player and uh, go check him out. I will put his link down below and also Dungeon Dudes. Those guys have a clip for anything. They have so many good resources and they have so diverse opportunities for you to choose from how you want to play. Check them out guys. They are also very awesome. And Matthew Colville. Go check him out. I mean, he is actually one of the best. Um, it's very intimidating when you first want to start DMing or being a dungeon master. And he is totally the one that gave me the courage to just try it out. Go check his videos as well. The links will also be down below. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put another link down below that I actually want you to check out as well. It's about this area in the 80s called uh, the Satanic Panic, which is ridiculous it's it's basically about people who believed that playing this game meant you were being part of the occult like the kid who is playing this character is actually performing a real spell or a real ritual i mean they're killing goblins do you believe they were killing real goblins you know they don't exist right well people were kind of acting like this woman in water boy because little girls are the devil girls are the devil I mean, it, it's ridiculous. It's like saying to your friend, like, Hello, Wendy. How's John? What's he doing these days? Well, he's actually studying in medicine. Really? Medicine? But he's nine. Yeah, well, I bought him this game. It's Operation, the wacky doctor's game, where you're the wacky doctor. Battery's not included. I am doing it. My turn. Take out a spare ribs for $100. It takes a steady hand because if you touch the side... Nobody were complaining about this game. They're actually performing surgery at home, these children. Somebody called the medical society. They must be stopped. Or at least fined heavily. I mean, if he's playing that game, is he actually performing a surgery? No, he's playing a game. Well, you know what I mean. Um, but... <laughs> go go check it out guys um and let's just be glad things are a little bit different and people a little bit more enlightened now, i'm not saying this to slam on christians because i am a christian myself but seeing the devil in every teacup what's the point i'm not denying evil in the world there's definitely evil in the world but come on you can't blame games music everything else for what is going on with our children and around us face the problem and love your children anyway go check it out this other video that i really want to show you instead to flip the burger completely on that satanic panic and see how much joy dungeons and dragons actually gives people see our vast community of nerds now playing dungeons and dragons coming together i want you to see this clip i will link 
link it down below i will suggest you and recommend it to be the next video you see after this it is called defeat your demons with dungeons and dragons phantom uncovered and take a look how dungeons and dragons how how big it has become and how much joy it brings to so many people it is being used as a tool for for young adolescents to help them become social and get them out of their shells and when people have rough lives it gives them the ability to escape reality for just a moment and have some fun and be somewhere else and i completely understand when you watch that clip you hear people sharing their stories and how Dungeons & Dragons or gaming helps them. To be honest Dungeons & Dragons and D&D has become so much more than just a game for so many people. I love that video, please go check it out and tell me down below in the comments what you think. Defeat your demons with Dungeons & Dragons Phantom Uncovered. That was just a minute for me for being a bit serious. I don't know guys, what do you think? Do you agree? Do you disagree? If you haven't played Dungeons & Dragons before, are you ready to try it? Or the Dungeon Master if you haven't tried that before? Go on, just try it. You will not regret it. It will change your life. <laughs> uh, I think this will be my episode about Dungeons & Dragons. There will be many more where we're gonna get in more depth about specific things, about multiclassing backgrounds, all kinds of things that I want to talk about. This was just a very short, basic introduction to Dungeons and & Dragons, and no, I am not being sponsored by uh, Wizards of the Coast or anyone. I'm doing this for free, I'm doing this for fun, I'm doing this because I love Dungeons & Dragons, and I love nerdish things, guys. Well, this is what I had for this episode, guys. I just want to give you a brief introduction to Dungeons & Dragons, and I will see you later. Bye, nerds.